Welcome to Hot Weekly. I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And this is Haunt Weekly, a weekly podcast for the haunted attraction industry. Whether you're an actor, owner, or just plain aficionado, we aim to be the podcast for you. And we are back for another week. This is an exciting topic. <laughs> These show notes were written drunk. <laughs> nah. Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> probably not. Oh, probably not, no. Not this time. No, usually, yeah, it's opposite podcast. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. But no, we have a very exciting, a, a podcast dear to our hearts here in New Orleans, a very alcohol-tolerant community. We're talking about the role of alcohol in haunting, if there is a role, should there be a role, and how to implement it. Um, but first things first, how are you doing, Crystal? I'm doing well. It's been a busy, busy week for the two of us. We are keeping active with our day jobs and everything else. We, Yeah. Um... I don't know if you know this, but this is not our full-time gig. <laughs> this is something that we do as an aside thing, and we do it because we love it and enjoy it. But yeah, yep. staying very, very busy. Um, we've got to we got to do some of these recordings back to back to back, though. At some point, not today, but at some point soon, we've got to do multiple recordings together so we can have a a, a um, padding here. Oh, yeah. Like, What's the fun of that? I know. Then we're not at the edge of the cliff, I ready know. to fall exactly. off at any moment. <laughs> exactly. We need a little drama to make this podcast go well. Yeah. Well, first thing is first, we do have our usual conference reminders this week. Yes. Um, would you like to take the first one or you want me to? I can. Okay, go for it. First one is Virginia Haunt Fest, June 3rd and 4th at Misty Mountain Camp Resort in Greenwood, Virginia. Aimed at Virginia Haunters at VirginiaHauntFest.com. Yes. Um, it looks like a fun campy type of, like camping type of. Haunted um, conference. It could be campy, too. I, it could be. I don't know, okay? I have never I think been... you've got too much Rocky Horror. I or not have, enough. I'm One of the other. My Rocky Horror levels are askew, I admit it. I did not get to watch Rocky Horror tonight. I, oh. I'm sad. Okay, but after that, we have the Midwest Haunters Convention at the Greater Columbus Convention Center in Columbus, Ohio. Also with a tour of the Scaratorium. <laughs> it's at MidwestHauntersConvention.com. Right, and next we have a new addition. Yes. Thank you, big thank you to Greg Packard who contacted us through our Facebook page. Proof for... we do actually read the damn thing. <laughs> yes, and the addition is Midsummer Scream Halloween Festival. MidsummerScream.org is where you can find the information. That is going on July 30th and 31st in Long Beach Convention Center from Creepy LA and Theme Park Adventure Universal Disney Six Flags Knots. Scary Farm. Farm in attendance and sponsoring. This is their first year, guys. Give them some love. Yeah, this is a first year conference, and it seems pretty huge, all in all. Yeah, those are some big names. Those are some very, very big names. I'm actually really excited about this. And, and uh, I'm a little embarrassed we didn't have it before. I'm not going to lie. Well, but, you know, we do the best we can in getting these lists, and... That's why we asked for suggestions, yeah, exactly. and that's why Greg was so helpful in providing Yes, it. thank you, Greg, again. Um, next, after that, July 29th through 31st, it is Chicago Frights at the Orland Park, Illinois. Giorgio's Quality... I keep wanting to say it like it's Cheerios. <laughs> Giorgio's Quality Inn and Suites. Find out more at ChicagoFrights.com. That is kind of the uh, sister um, uh, sister conference, the Haunt Con. Right. Uh, Scare LA, August 6th and 7th at the Pasadena Convention Center, ScareLA.com. This is the one that Elvira is hosting, as we've yes. mentioned for many weeks now. Yes. After that, September 9th through 11th, it is Mask Fest at the Marriott Indianapolis East in Indianapolis, Indiana. You can find out more at MaskFest.com. And finally, for this part, Legendary Haunt Tour, November 11th and 12th, Pittsburgh, and it's by the trans world people. The hotel's to be announced. Pretty much everything's to be announced still. <laughs> but look up the information at Legendary Haunt Tour with two T's. Two T's. Dot com, and um, we for do. forthcoming information. Yes. And we do know that attendees will be touring the Scare House and the Hundred Acres Manor. Not to be confused with the Hundred Acres Woods. That is Winnie the Pooh. 
Yes. That the, I, I know that they both are terrifying alternate realities. Yes. <laughs> We're going to have to find something else. I know. <laughs> I, I gotta find another joke. You do, I, I <laughs> but <sorry>. that's okay. <laughs> but yes, um, getting ourselves back on topic this week, we are talking about alcohol and haunting, and yep. this is a weird topic. But it's one we've actually had on the list pretty much since day one. Yeah, and that's because we've we've dealt with people coming in as customers who are drunk. Yes, and we have seen actors get drunk. Yes, um, and. Neither of which ended well. No, neither of which ended well at all. By the way, vomit in a fog, high, high-powered fog machine, not a good thing. No. Just throwing that one out. Um, not, not, not good at all. Uh, but yeah, it's. It, this is a topic that's dear to us in part because of where we live. Right. We live in New Orleans, and New Orleans definitely has a, a very strong alcohol culture. Yeah, yeah, we're very tolerant of alcohol here. It's a different alcohol culture than I've seen anywhere else in the U.S. Yes. I would say that some of the foreign countries we visited have we're, similar. Yeah, I would say like uh, our time in Budapest and Newcastle, I think, yeah. are very similar in that regard. But, you know, and also here in town, what, oh, sorry, what were you about to say? The, the only problem is, though, is that haunted attractions get a lot of tourists in addition to the locals. And a lot of times, tourists, when they come to a city where it's their first time where alcohol is accessible literally everywhere, yeah, um, then they get a little crazy. That is, that is a significant issue, I think, with some of the New Orleans haunts. Right. Is because you have people who come into town from, like, Miss, especially from, like, Mississippi and... West Texas, or East Texas, rather, not West Texas. Dear yeah, God, that'd be hell of a drive. You remember when we were coming back through Mississippi and we saw a new kind of alcohol in the, the case I, at a gas station I, and they I, said, you can't buy that at Sunday. And we were like, what? <laughs> yeah, I think it was the first time we actually saw on the shelf the uh, uh, Stellar Trois Cidre. Yeah. I think that's what it was. And we're like, we haven't seen it. We heard it was coming, but we hadn't seen it anywhere. Yeah. Ellie likes cider. Yeah. So this is, hey, hey, this is pro. What do you mean we can't buy it, asshole? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know. Yeah. But anyways, the point of it is, you know, like here in New Orleans, we have such an open um, attitude toward alcohol. And the two major haunts in our area are the House of Shock and the Mortuary. Yes. And in this issue, they could not be further apart. Right. And by in our area, we mean New Orleans tourists itself. from the French Quarter could get onto a streetcar yes. or, or take a taxi or whatever to get to them. Um, yeah, actually within, like, the G&O area. Yeah. Not, and, yeah, they are completely opposite on it. Yeah. Uh, House of Shock, as we will, I'm sure, will discuss, has not one but two full-service bars. Yes. That are... Way overpriced. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, it's gonna be hard to get drunk there because of that. You better be Richie McRickens McRichenstein or something if you're gonna get get drunk there. <laughs> but yes, um, and the mortuary has a strict no alcohol policy. Right now, I no BYOB there. No. Now, the the truth of the matter is though, the mortuary is more in the norm here. Right, as far as the ones that we've been to. But we did cover a couple of stories recently where haunted attractions are opening bars that are attached to yes. the haunt. This is, this is, I think currently right now, based on this is based on also the research I did for this. Right. I looked up a bunch of haunts and found their alcohol, that mentioned alcohol in any way on their site. Right. And the result was like 90 plus percent no. strictly forbade alcohol of any sort. Right. And, but I do agree with you that there is, it's kind of like escape rooms. Yeah. It's a growing trend among haunts to start adding bars, to start adding that element to it. Right. Um, to make the haunt more of a destination for visiting rather than just... Yeah, and I think that if you went the route of having a, a place that serves meals that was family-friendly and just happened to have beer or something... Yeah. That's different from setting up a bar specifically yeah. for alcohol consumption on the premises. Yes, which is exactly like so what House of Shock does twice over. They right. do have a place that serves food. I've heard it's good. Um, yeah. I've never actually had it. I've heard it's good. Uh, yeah. 
I, ne- I never eat there. It's like fair food, right? <laughs> yeah, it's fair. It's, yeah. Yeah, they have, they have some, to my, not like burgers and stuff. They have like some yeah. things, if I remember correctly. But yeah. But yeah, and the reason, though, that it's so commonly banned is pretty straightforward. Being drunk and a haunt is dangerous. Yes. Period. <laughs> Yeah. That's it. Yep. That's done. That. done. We're episode Podcast over. Knocking off early. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Halloween. We'll see you next week. No. Yeah, no. no it, um, it, but it is. It's extremely dangerous. Right. Because especially very inebriated people have problems walking in a straight line on a flat surface. Um, so just imagine trying to go through, you know, dark hallways around corners and with different lighting. And <clears throat> yeah. this is how you get sick people in your haunt. And yeah. hurt. Possibly Second, injured. Yeah, because like I said, you got lots of dark corners and lots of, you know, narrowish hallways. Still fully compliant with the ADA people, but yes. narrowish. Yeah. Or any, um, you have scary situations, we hope. Yeah. Otherwise, not much of a haunt, I hate to say it. Huh. And people, when they drink, a lot of them tend to be more aggressive. Yeah. And you know, we talk about fight or flight all the time right. on this podcast. It seems, in my experience, alcohol pushes people more toward the fight response. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what it is. Maybe there's some primal thing there that I don't get. Yeah, if anybody spent a night on Bourbon Street, um, there is a point in the night, and it's pretty late. Oh, it's very late. Where you start seeing the really drunk people, usually men, mm-hmm. uh, randomly start shoving each other. Yeah. And, like, yelling at each other. Not the, oh, I love you, bro. They're way past that point. Yeah. <laughs> and it's always interesting when you get to that point in the night. Because, it's like you said, they're shoving each other. But it rarely comes to, like, blows. Right. Because they're too drunk to actually throw an effective punch. Yeah. This is the this is the point of the night when the girls start going away and the guys get rowdy. <laughs> yeah. And it, 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 it's interesting. And, yeah, it's just... The truth that drunk people tend to be more violent, and that is a bad combination when you're trying actively to scare people. Right. Because I mean, we already have actors get punched. Yeah. That's life. We already have actors get punched. We have actors who get you know hit in various ways, other ways. That's life. But when you add a layer of alcohol on top of it, that just increases the likelihood and the severity of it, and it increases the danger for the customer as well as the actor. Right. Because and that's one of the things that people don't like to think about is that when a customer, you know, punches an actor, uh-huh. the truth of the matter is, in this equation, the person in most danger is the customer. Yeah. And the reason is it's much easier to break your hand than someone's face. Oh, yeah. You can break fingers, especially if you don't punch completely correctly. I mean, how long, when we were doing, you know, the Krav Maga stuff, how long did we spend just learning how to form a fist so we didn't break our hand? Oh, God. Yeah. That's like learning to make the rice and sushi. I mean, well, not only your hand, but your wrist is probably going to be, because I've seen drunk people try to punch. Bear paw. Yeah. Your wrist is going to get twisted. It's it's not going to be nice. Yeah. You're going to have a hurt hand way before you give someone a hurt face most of the time. Yeah. This is why punching to the face is generally not advisable. Yeah. Knee strikes. <laughs> <laughs> Much better. But yeah. And also, you know, since people are drunk, the likelihood of a trip, a fall, or some other injury just shoots right through the roof. Right. I mean, you have enough people who trip and fall when they're stone sober in yeah. a haunted attraction. You add in that extra little bit of unsteadiness, it's going to get worse. It is. And you also have to think of, you know... And this might be lower down on our show notes, um, are your liability. Yeah. So that if you are the one serving them and you're over serving them, then that's a real issue. And, yeah, and, and that th- makes it even more dangerous. Yeah, and this is something that like just regular bars have to wrestle with. Exactly. If they over, if a bar over serves a customer in most places right. and that customer walks home and gets hit by a car. They right. can be held at least partially liable. Right. Or even worse, you know, drives home, tries to drive yeah. home, and gets into a wreck, you know, the bar can be held partially liable. In some, under some circumstances, under some some rules. Yeah. Now, throw in a haunted attraction, which, excuse me, which also has a ton of liability stuff. Right. We've talked a lot about that over the course of this podcast, about how haunts have to deal with these issues. 
and try to make themselves safe enough so that they can't realistically be held liable when customers inevitably trip, fall, and do things like that. And fortunately, the courts have been pretty generous to us yeah. as an industry. They've been pretty good to us overall on that issue. That being said, when you start pumping people full of alcohol, I think the courts are going to take a dimmer view. Yeah, and I think that's because your intention is changing. Your intention isn't just to entertain people, and that's not just what people are there for. It's now an intention to serve alcohol to people. Yes. And then, you know, scare them. You also. are giving so. people something that will make them more likely to be injured and then putting them into a higher risk situation. Yes. That's really what it comes down to. Right. And it's because of this that most haunts completely and totally ban intoxicated customers. <coughs> now, I will say that I remember the first year we went to Mortuary. Yes. Um, I think it was a flashlight night. That sounds like us. But Also known as industry night sometimes. Yeah. Um, but they had different colored lights for different c customers. Like, we got the ones that said, yeah, they're completely sober and not causing any trouble in lines. You know, you they had a light for people who were reacting really well to... Every the, little scare. Or the every props. little scare in the... In the, pro the, pro the line, the, the line. queue. Yeah, the queue yeah, line. Yeah, the queue line. The, the actors. Queue, they were responding really good to the queue actors. Right. And the little, they all, that, that year, they also had the little animatronic props that would... Right. Occasionally pop up and do stuff, right. that stuff too. So yeah. and then the drunk people got the red lights. Yeah, because we asked the people because that's what we do. We find out shit. Um, yeah. what the different colored lights meant. And that's what that's what it meant. Yeah, was that the scares were going to be not as scary for them, and they were going to be more heavily closely guarded. Um, the guards were going to watch the security yeah. was. I'm going to uh, watch them a lot closer. And to be clear about this, and this is one of the challenges we face in this industry, is we're not necessarily talking about people who are stumbling, hopelessly drunk. Right. We're talking about people who are maybe a little bit intoxicated, but are still able to get around and maneuver through a haunted attraction. Right. There's no, a, if somebody shows up belligerently drunk, there's no way they're getting into any haunt that I know of. And we have had that happen at our haunt. Yes. I've turned people away before at the door. Yep. Um, I've had um, other other front of house crew help me do that before. Yeah. Luckily, with our haunt, because of the nature of it, that is extremely rare. Yeah. If it happens once or twice a season, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. But I know most other haunts, it's much more common. I mean, I guess people go out, get a little liquid courage for going into the haunted attraction. Right. Well, and this also brings up something. If you do have a, a no alcohol at all, you need to make that clear whenever people are purchasing their tickets online. Yes. Because if you have a, a zero tolerance policy and they buy <laughs> online and then they show up at your haunt drunk, they're gonna, you're, you're not going to want to refund their money, no. basically. No. You know. Because they're the ones that violated the rules, but if they don't know the rules, they can't follow them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not only, though, like I said, no alcohol is allowed on premise, no alcohol is sold, no drunk patrons are allowed, and no really drunk patrons. Right. Obviously, once again, there's a whole spectrum here of yeah. just st from stone sober to had just one beer and all the way to um, hangover part four, <laughs> basically, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, as you pointed out, though, it is important that you put this on the site and you put this somewhere fairly prominent yeah. if you're selling online ticketing. If there is, And this is not just for alcohol, but for any reason, someone could buy a ticket online and then not be allowed in. Right. Alcohol is one of the more common ones, I believe. Right. I would actually put um, a, a you agree to these terms of the haunt, like the rules of the haunt. You agree to it before it takes you to put in your credit card information. Yeah. I, I think that would be the safest way to do it. Make I, sure I, I that would, they got I would it. tend to agree because the main thing there is you want to make sure that there are no surprises. Right. That when they show well. up, <laughs> they're drunk people. They're easily surprised, Crystal. Come on. I know. There but, should be no surprises. But there are surprises in haunted houses. That's part of the point. <laughs> I meant amongst the rules. I know. Still. Of course there's surprises in the haunt. Yes. <laughs> what kind of haunt would it be if it didn't have some surprises? Exactly. But no surprises to get into the haunt. Exactly. No surprises by getting in. Right. 
Right. Um, you know, and it's like like we said, we've had to deal with that. Yeah. And it's frustrating. And it's very, very diff. It's very annoying because yeah. it's something that's very disruptive for everyone. Yeah. Because uh, they, they tend to be very belligerent. They are not happy that they're being asked right. to leave. It's unpleasant for all the other customers around them. Yeah, they make a scene. And it can make someone else's night that isn't drinking oh. have a bad taste in their mouth when they leave because it wasn't handled properly. Yeah, it, it, and exactly. So that's the other piece of advice I guess I would say here is, especially with your front of house actors and your front of house security, make sure you have solid protocols in line for dealing with the drunk patrons. I'm sure your haunt probably does. Right. If it's of any scale, it does. Yeah, and even though... And we even have one in our small yeah, scale. <laughs> we do. And even though this isn't part of this topic this week, we are talking just about customers mainly. Mm-hmm. But I do want to throw in there, if your customers cannot drink, your actors are not Absolutely. allowed. Absolutely. Your and, actors shouldn't be allowed anyway. Well, I mean, <laughs> but, and, yeah, our general rule <laughs> when it comes to actors, and we'll just go ahead and throw this out there, because yeah. I think it is relevant, because we are talking about alcohol in the broader yeah. sense. This, this makes sense. We'll, we'll, we'll divert for a moment here. Okay. Our rule when it comes to our actors and drinking is when you are here from the time you show up, before, you know, to get makeup and all that stuff on. Right. To when the haunt closed. That's usually about a five-hour span for us. Yeah. Of time. No drinking, no drugs, period. Yeah. Now, once we shut the haunt down and we clean up everything, I'll go with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll, go to, we'll go to the bar up the road or whatever and we'll get hammered out of our... Bl- <laughs> yeah, and do it all again the next night. We'll do it again the next but. night. That's fine. But yes, when we're on the clock and the reason, once again, it comes back to safety... Yep. Actors who are drunk are more likely to hurt themselves, are more likely to hurt customers. And we saw firsthand, one of the haunts we volunteered at, what happens when that is not adequately enforced, when someone sneaks moonshine in. Yeah, and we've talked about that before on this podcast, actually, it that was experience. A, yeah, it was not pleasant. No. Um, and it it really, I mean, we're, we were kind of fortunate as far as the, the, the team goes, mm-hmm. and that that was not a busy night. Right. I was working the ticket booth, I believe, that night when yeah. it all went down. I was actually out front. I was front of house. You were either there or in that stupid drop panel. Yeah, uh, I think I was. I think I was front of house that night. Oh, okay. I think I only did that drop panel one night. Thank you, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, but no. Um, yeah, I think I was front of house. But it, it it was super lucky that it was not a busier night because that whole section of the haunt lost all of its actors pretty much. That graveyard sequence lost everything. Yeah. Because all three of the ghouls that were supposed to be in working it got so blitzed that, well, we'll just say there was police involvement even. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and we'll was, just leave it there. It was not pleasant. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. And it, and this also is before season, whenever you're building, um, you're using power tools and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's dangerous to not be in your best. Now, I'm not going to sit here and lie and no. say I've never had a beer. No. While working on the haunt, that is, that has definitely happened. Yeah. But at the same time, you're absolutely correct. You you should not be getting blitzed. And the advantage of, by the way, working well, and drinking at the same time like that is usually you're not able to drink fast enough because you're too busy with your hands. Well, and the other thing is, is that the few times we have had a drink or something, whenever is when we were painting. It yeah. wasn't when we were using saws. Yeah, we're not using saws, drills, anything that may maim or injure yes. us. Yes. Yeah. And it's or not climbing like, ladders, dear God. Uh, yeah. I cannot imagine doing that. No. So. Yeah. Just be careful, people. Safety. What so, are we always going back to? Safety so first. That, we just should rename this the Safety Weekly Podcast <laughs> sometime. <clears throat> then we could talk about safety in all aspects exactly. of Exactly. Oh, no. man. That'd be a lot of, no, no, no. Let's no. not do no. that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there, when it comes to alcohol, there is an alternative approach. Okay. And the alternative approach is to actually sell alcohol. Yes. That's the other side of this. This is what we were talking about is starting to trend. Yeah. Now, there are advantages to this approach. Yeah. Um, the main one is that alcohol is a very high margin item, especially if you mark it up the way the House of Shock does. <laughs> it does not cost $8 to hand me a beer. I'm just saying. And a can and out a can. of the cooler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that you can do is you can still bar drinks at the door. You still don't allow the alcohol into the haunt. Right. So you still have that 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 
I guess you would say that uh, firewall there. Yeah. Or I guess fireball wall. Huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> but Come on. anyway, um, yeah, and I think maybe if you ha- if you have a reputation mm-hmm. of having people show up completely drunk to go through your haunt, then putting in a bar where you could actually limit how yeah. drunk people get. Yeah. Is not necessarily a bad alternative. Okay, because I mean, think of it like this: if you have a bar and you charge eight dollars a mixed drink or whatever, right. right? Which actually is not a completely unreasonable price for a haunted attraction bar. No. So charge eight bucks for a mixed drink, but you set a two drink maximum. Right. Basically, what you've done is you've for those customers who do want to drink, you've got sixteen dollars a lot of that pure profit because. Mixed drinks are already a high margin item, right? Um, from those customers, and you haven't really changed the calculus on safety any, right? Because that's not going to impact them significantly, right? Especially as long as they don't pregame, which is a yeah. big fear. But I've found, and this is something I've noticed, is that patrons are much less likely to pregame if they think their drinks there. Yeah. They're not going to load up and then go to the haunt. Right. They're going to go to the haunt with the intent of loading up. And then you and your bar staff can restrict them and hold them back from it. Right. And the other um, question here is, do you put your bar, if you're going to have one, at the beginning before they go in or at the end after they exit? I personally think it sounds better to do it after they exit. Uh Uh-huh. But... I understand both approaches. How is the shock as it so that one bar is positioned on the way in? Right. And one is positioned more at the exit, even though technically you can get to it before you go in. Yeah. It's just kind of awkward ish. Because when you exit the house of shock, you like run right into this bar. Oh, yeah. You pretty much, if you, if you were like really running, you would literally crash into the bar. Yeah. And then I didn't stop for like 120 feet or so. It's, it's a pretty good span there. It is. <clears throat> But if merch you were, tables and stuff. Merch too. tables and other stuff, but you would literally crash into the bar. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can get at it from the other side, but it's much more difficult. Right. And, and one of the other things to think about, um, if you are doing a bar, is that you could make a custom drink for your haunt. Absolutely. I think you should. Yes, you should. And you could sell it in a souvenir cup. Yes. Now so, that there you go. Guys bar Rescue have, 101, guys. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. John Taffer approved approach. <laughs> I may have watched too many of those. No, a few too many. <laughs> it's, it's the guilty pleasure of the house. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's it's the idea here is straightforward though. This puts you in charge of the alcohol consumption your patrons do. Right, <clears throat> and it puts you in charge of where they do it. Yes, and it lets you keep an eye. It lets you know who has had how much. It lets you set you no. Know, Turn, turn them off whenever you need to. Yeah. <clears throat> Cut them off. Basically, the idea is that this puts you in control, and it gives you a high margin item that you can sell. And the other thing it really does is, and this is something we've talked about a lot, if you go through a haunted house, a good walkthrough time for a haunt would be anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, basically. Yeah. Not bad. Good no. walkthrough time. That's not an evening. <laughs> No. An evening that does not make. No. And that's one of the things we're seeing more and more haunts do is they're either adding new attractions so that you spend more time there. Right. But a lot of them, and we're seeing this like at 13th Gate, we're seeing this at House of Shock, we're seeing this in various locations, they're adding concerts. They're adding, you know, restaurants, bars, festival stuff. Yeah. They're, they're trying to make it, you know, a multi-dimensional attraction that you can seriously spend, you know, a few hours at right. and kill a good portion of an evening, mm-hmm. which I think is how it should be. And the thing about that is, is every one of these avenues you're opening up, I guess other than concerts, the concerts are usually free, but everything you open up is another potential profit source right? of various uh, margins. And we all love our high margin items. And once again, alcohol is about as high margin of an item as you're going to get. Yes, and right there was sodas. <laughs> right there was sodas. Yeah, it is. It is ridiculous how much money you can make off of um, off of alcohol, and I can see why haunts are tempted by it. But there are some problems with that approach. 
Okay. Problem one, it makes it less family friendly. Yeah. And this is, okay, I say less family friendly. In New Orleans, that's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> Every family friendly attraction sells alcohol in this yeah, city. Yeah, because you go to a kid's arcade or a laser tag and they're going to have yeah. alcohol for you. They got drink. daiquiris, they got beer, you're fine. Wine. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, I mean, they sell wine at Chuck E. Cheese. Some, some, at least some Chuck yeah. E. Cheeses. I don't know about all of them. Right. But at least some Chuck E. Cheeses do sell wine, which I've always found hilarious. Yeah. And Ellie has told us that they sell wine by 12 ounces. Yeah. <laughs> Not in wine glasses, by like beer size. Yeah. Um, so yeah. who wants to go to Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah. Um, I can borrow a kid. Yeah, the movie theaters here all have stocked bars. I believe they actually do cocktail drinks there. Yes, they do. Um, the the they, one nearest us has a place called McGuffin's, which I think is yes. a great name for a movie theater bar. It is. By the um, way, creative name for your bar if you do it. Think of it. Yeah. Be thinking about it. The World War II Museum here has two bars in it. Oh, really? I did not know that. Yes, it has, two can- <laughs> it has the Cantina Bar where the... Uh, the girls perform the um, old songs. The ragtime stuff, yeah. Yeah. And then it has like a little bistro style, but it has a full service bar. I did it. not know that. I, I, yeah. <clears throat> this is me learning stuff on Haunt Weekly. This is cool. Yep. So yeah, that's not necessarily true in New Orleans where we're yeah. at. But in most places, selling alcohol does at least severely damage the family friendly element of it. Right. Which, you, it says that you are targeting more towards adults than... Which, you know, if you already are with your theme and your marketing, right. that may not be a loss. Right. I mean, that's why I think the House of Shock can get away with it, is because yeah. they are they have always said they are for adults. Yes. Um, and yet every time, every slipping time we're in line, we're surrounded by the 10-year-olds. Yeah. I don't know how the hell that happens. Their parents are horrible. That's how that happens. <laughs> you want to see some crying kitties? There are some crying kitties for you. Yeah. And that actually has happened at least once to us. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it, it does make it less family friendly. Right. So know your audience, know who your clientele are, yeah. and know that if losing a significant portion of that audience would be harmful to you. Yes. Think of it that way. It does create complications for child actors, too. Right. Because a lot of places, if you look at the child labor laws, don't allow children where alcohol is sold. Yes. They don't allow them to work. Right. At you all. You have to be a certain age to be able to work anyway. The um the only exception I found recently was that you can be in a bar if you're underage, if you're part of a band and the the uh, alcohol license holder signs a form saying that you're there to perform and mm-hmm. your parents are there to watch you. Yeah. Which there may be something like that for haunts. Now one possible yeah. solution is to incorporate the bar and all that underneath a different business name. And even if it's at the same, um, like, general location, right? it's not the same building, usually, as the haunted attraction. Right. And going back to House of Shock... Look up your local laws. Yeah. Look up your local laws. And going back to House of Shock, because that is our local one that has alcohol on the Now, process. we're going to keep referencing back to that. I yeah. can't help it. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so, their bars are outside. Any kid actors are inside. Yeah, basically. They're completely separated. So I, I'm, you may, depending upon your local codes, be able to... This isn't like, you know, a lot of the fire safety stuff that's pretty much national. This is very hyper-regional here. Right. Like a lot of our alcohol codes are just New Orleans alcohol codes. Right. Not even like Louisiana codes. They're yeah. New Orleans. Like, <clears throat> like in New Orleans, we have the ability to drink in public. One of like t- 10 or 12 places in the country you can do it. Yeah. Um, we have it citywide, and that's definitely not a Louisiana thing. You do that in Alexandria or somewhere, <laughs> yeah. or Shreveport or Lafayette or whatever. It's, it's going to be a different story. Yeah, well, there are, even in Lafayette, there are sections set up, but uh, but it's not citywide, and basically the only rule here is don't use a glass bottle or and that, and That's purely container. for safety reason, yeah. Yeah, because they don't want... Drunk people breaking glass and yeah. then falling in it. Yeah, basically, or, or others yep. falling into it or whatever. Well, yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, my, my, do think about how this is going to impact your ability. If you use child actors, how it's going to impact your ability. And remember, a child actor 
now could be anyone under the age of 21. Yeah. You may have actually just raised your child actor age, too. Right. So be thinking about that and figure out how you're going to work within your laws to do that. And it may also, um, if their parents had agreed to it and then found out you're selling alcohol, they may pull them from being an actor exactly. for you. Exactly. There may be some pushback that way, even if you have resolved the legal potential legal issues. Right. Um, you will see fewer younger patrons. Yeah. If you do this. I mean, I touched on it briefly with the family-friendly thing, but it's, yep. it's true. You're going to see fewer. Um, you will need to increase security. Yes. You're going to need to increase security, both with the anticipation of handling more intoxicated people, but also to enforce any drink maximums you put in. Right. I mean, that's really what it's going to come down to. Any rules you put at this bar, basically, it's this. When you have a taco stand or a burger stand or whatever at your haunt, mm -hmm. you don't have to sit there and limit people to only ordering two burgers or two tacos. Yeah, that's that's up to them. <laughs> they can eat all the food they're willing to buy from you. Yeah. That's totally fine. Um, the, the thing about it is you do have to have those limitations, those reasonable limitations with a bar, plan accordingly when it comes to your security. Yeah. Um. And like I said, this is going to increase the uh, likelihood of some drunk customers trying to go in. And also, you're going to need that extra security to monitor anyone who is borderline. To make right. sure they're okay. Talked about the red lights and so forth at the mortuary. You have customers that are clearly under the influence to some degree. But a judgment call was made. They are allowed to go in. They are safe enough. Which in the mortuary with all those stairwells, I would be terrified of doing that <laughs> with a drop of alcohol in my system. Yeah. It's a very beautiful old mortuary, but those stairwells scare the crap out of me worse than anything <laughs> in the haunt. Yeah. I, I'm I don't I don't usually get the EBG I don't usually get nervous around stairwells, but man, those old windy narrow yeah. staircases will do it to you. Yeah, the abyss was worse though. Yeah, the abyss was their, their their staircase was pretty hellish. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's it's strange to think about inebriated customers going through that at all to me. It, it's bizarre. Yeah. Um. So we've talked a lot about the House of Shock versus the Mortuary. We've compared them. Right. Um. One thing I wanted to point out, and one thing I've noticed, is, and I think alcohol just is one element of this, but it's that the Mortuary seems to do much more business with families and the House of Shock does. Right. Well, and because we know actors from both, or former actors... Um, well, some former and some current. Right. The The mentality that they go at haunting is completely different, Agreed. too. Because Mortuary sees it as a business, and from the actors that we know, it's, it's like going to a, an office job. Whereas the House of Shock is more of camaraderie, and it's basically a giant playhouse for their actor, for friends to get together and hang out. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think that that mentality is probably why one has alcohol and one doesn't. Yeah, and I do think that is part of it. <clears throat> but it's always interesting because when you're dealing with these two haunts, that even though they are literally just a few miles from one another, even though they literally are catering to the exact same audience, right? They take such wildly different approaches, and they—I mean, the more, last time we were at the mortuary, one of those really annoying party buses <laughs> dropped yeah. off like a bunch of like twelve-year-old girls. Yeah, twelve to sixteen. You wouldn't see that crap at the House of Shock. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> it, no. it was actually quite hilarious because then it was uh, the hilarious part about it for me though was that like all but like two of them chickened out yeah well and that's that's part of why last year's theme at mortuary was so confusing for me yeah it's because i've always thought of them as more family friendly the family friendly alternative kind yeah. of thing um I mean, well but, i mean and yes they're still bloody they're still gory they're still yeah all that jess but you know, they don't sell alcohol. They don't do sex stuff. They don't do... Until last year. Until last year. Which they, is <laughs> which is why I was... Yeah. They totally I, I'm do. wondering if they're trying to find... Anyway, that's another podcast. Another podcast. That's another topic. But yes, they, they, they provide the more family-friendly experience. We always see lots of family, lots of kids there. Yeah. 
And that's not true of the House of Shock. So there's a very different vibe. And I know that alcohol is just a part of that. Right. But it's still an integral part of it. Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, Mortuary is a more traditional haunted attraction, just in every way, shape, and form. The House of Shock is the more adult one. Right. Not and, saying it's scarier or less scary or whatever. Yeah. It's just who it's how it's marketed and promoted. Right. Okay. So that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, and I would like to add that both seem to be doing well. I know House of Shock oh, yeah. had financial trouble and closed down or nearly closed down. Right. And then resurrected itself, even though it never really actually closed. It's, yeah. It's, it's complicated. It, it is. Um, but, well, and, and here's the last note on the alcohol sales and losing because of families. Yeah. Think Really think about why you would want to exclude anyone. If this is potentially excludes anyone from going to your haunt, why are you limiting your market? And the theory, I think, and the response to that would be, well, we're hoping to make more money off alcohol than we would from the customers we lose. And right. my advice there is, quite simply, look at who already is going to your haunt. Yeah. If your haunt is 50% you know, kids under the age of 16 or whatever, yeah. you probably are going to lose way more selling alcohol than you'll ever gain. I'd agree. But if it's only 5%, yeah. You might benefit from that secondary income. Yeah. You know, so th that's a way to look at it. Um, so, yeah, should you do it? I think it depends upon who your clients already are, your customers already are. Right. If they, if it makes sense for the customers you already have. And for your business, business model. And your business model and for your marketing and everything else you got going on. Right. Fine. I would not sacrifice a significant portion. I would not even re jeopardize it. Right. I would say that, you know, I, Vault of Souls actually does have cocktails. Mm -hmm. um, but that is, that is such a different experience from what I understand it to be yes. than a normal haunted house. Because it, it's, he, he described it like a full evening out. Because yeah. you get food, you get cocktails, you're in period dress, you get entertained by, you know, Heart musicians layer. and things. And then you get to go and explore the, the huge basement. Yeah. Basically, or the vault. You get to wander around it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, that being said, um, if you do decide you want to go that route... Obviously, look up what it takes to obtain your liquor license and probably set it up on a separate business. Yeah, for the so, reasons we discussed earlier. reasons we just discussed earlier. Now, here's the thing. Liquor licenses in New Orleans yeah. are silly easy to obtain, it seems. Yeah. I, I hardly know anyone that's ever struggled yeah. getting one. Um, so they, they, that seems to be pretty simple. Your area, your county, your town, it could be very difficult. It could be very complicated. It could be very expensive. Yes. A lot of these liquor licenses are very, very pricey to obtain. And they usually require background checks. They usually require a certain amount of training and mm -hmm. other things. So look up the requirements to your area and see what you need and see if it's even worthwhile. Yeah. Um, beyond that... You know, look up how to handle and you know, set up policies for handling drunk customers. You yes. probably already have a policy because every haunt has had this problem. But that being said, realize that these drunk customers are now going to be your customers and your, I don't want to say fault, that may not be adequately fair, but right. they're getting high on your supply, basically. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, and I, I would say not only, you know, have the policy in place, but make it clear to the customers, yes. too. That if they act in an inappropriate way, this is what will happen exactly. to them. You're going to need new, obviously, lots of new signage here. You're going to have to keep because your situation is unique when compared to just like a regular bar. Yeah. You know, regular bars aren't going to give people lots of alcohol and then send them down a bunch of dark corridors. No. <laughs> you know. No, we would hope not. I would hope not. That was a terrible bar I went to once. Yeah. <laughs> No, the, the, so think about the cost of selling alcohol. Think about the benefits. Make a decision if it's right for you. That being said, as we said in the beginning of this episode, most haunts do ban alcohol right. pretty strictly. Um, I looked up, like I said, a bunch of different haunted attractions. It seems like nearly all have very, very hard and fast rules against alcohol. Yeah. 
And the reasons are, just simply put, the benefits do not outweigh the risk. In some cases, it may not even be possible for them to do it. Yeah. If they if they can't get a liquor license for their type of establishment... They could be in a dry county. They could be in a dry county. They could be um, in a place that will not allow, you know, and not zoned, basically, right. for alcohol sales. Like they, There's a million reasons they might not be able to. And that's life. You know, that's just how it is. But, yeah, most have very strict, no alcohol, no drugs, no weapons. It's, it's in that list of no's. Yes. And No, 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 no. And, you know, I looked up a lot of the bigger haunts, and they definitely all strictly forbade alcohol. They strictly forbade, obviously, inebriated customers. If you're not going to allow, why would you ever allow an inebriated customer into a haunted attraction? That just seems... Dangerous. Like, like an accident waiting to happen, quite literally. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about consent in this house. Yeah. If they're too inebriated to consent to things outside of a haunted house, then they might not be able to consent to actually going in. Yeah, exactly. Now, <clears throat> all that being said, some haunts do. We talked about House of Shocker Radio, but also interesting, and I found this one out interesting when I was researching, the Winchester House which is the very famous house with the, built by the crazy Winchester people. Right. The, the stairwells that get nowhere and that type of stuff. Right, the wife that was exactly. haunted by ghosts, right? Exactly, yes. Of all the people who... Yeah, they have a haunted guns. attraction. That's awesome. Which, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Can we go? Well, that yes. sounds awesome. And we can actually do overnight stays with booze. Oh. Ah. <clears throat> so... That makes sense. Because it does. That sounds awesome, though. I, I'm a little nervous going to a... Uh, House that built, you know, so centered around guns and alcohol. Well, actually, well... Uh, the Winchester House, think about it for your answer. No, I know that, and I know that she felt that she was haunted by the, the ghost. ghost of all the people that guns had killed. Or their guns, specifically, I guess. Yes. Their, her her, her, her fortune, the, the yes. guns that made her fortune. Yes. How about we say that? Yes. But yeah, it, it, it looked really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, the little bit I was able to read about it, but they do allow alcohol <clears throat> and that's just it. And that may be one of the things you have to consider is if you do things like the mortuary also does overnight stays. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if they allow alcohol in that. I didn't see that in any of their policies one way right. or the other, but maybe those types of attractions, it does make more sense. Yeah. But. Well, yeah, cause you could have alcohol with dinner. You could, it's a whole evening. It's a whole experience. It's. Yeah, that's that, different. That's different, exactly. But you still don't want your customers, even if they are staying overnight, to get just completely trashed. Exactly. Now, and and that's what it comes down to at the end of it is it's right for some attractions, it's not right for others. I think for most, it's going to be not right though. Yeah. And the reasons are, I just think the cost of setting it up is too damn high. I think the risks in terms of alienating a significant percent of your customer base is too damn high. Yeah. And the risks for safety in the haunt are just too damn high. Hmm. Sensing a theme. I know. So, I, for me, I don't think most haunts can do it. I mean, we have talk a lot about what we're going to do as we, you know, edge ourselves more professionally. Right. Um, and then also looking at the haunts we've worked with and worked in and so forth, I couldn't see any of them doing it or us doing it. Yeah. Just because it's not right for what we're trying to do. Yeah. Is it? cool is it hip and is new orleans definitely one of the better environments for doing it yeah yes but i still don't think it's right for me and what we do now quick uh aside here i was thinking about this just a minute ago obviously no alcohol ever in an escape room don't be stupid <laughs> that is gotta be one of the worst uh, that thought popped into my head what about escape rooms like that is dumb I don't know. You solve puzzles better whenever you've been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Wiley e. Coyote game. Oh, God, Way yeah. back when. Oh, yeah. Um, but no, what I was actually thinking that just popped in my head was that if you were going to enforce a two-drink minimum. Or maximum. Maximum, yeah. Two-drink maximum. Uh -huh. The opposite of what it normally is. Um, you could actually put, like, little crosses or, or X's or something on people's hands so that they can't take off whatever it is that you are, are sh yeah, or mean, pass them off to somebody else. Exactly, because that's the problem with, like, drink tickets. Yeah. Which is something that happened. <laughs> um, you know, I'll spare the full story, but basically we've been regaled repeatedly with tales of, you know, Ellie 
being a hard drinker at the company Christmas party, and they enforced a drink maximum with tickets. Right. And so all the teetotalers just gave her the ticket, their tickets. Yeah. And it all ended up being the same. The same, amount, the same yeah. anyway. So, yeah, that, that yeah. a drink ticket system, while tempting, will not actually enforce it unless you can find a way to tether it to the person. Right. Which is... Yeah, I think something like on the hand or something like that might be your best approach, yeah. honestly. And make it something cool. Make it something people yeah, want on their like, hand. Uh, honestly, get like a stamp. If you're going to do it like this, just an idea. Yeah. Get a stamp of your haunt's logo or something and put it on. Or, well, it's got to be something that can that can add up. So you could have like a little graveyard. Yeah. <laughs> little tombstones. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> tombstones down. Tombstones down. <laughs> You can have three bats. <laughs> there you go. Three bats on your hand and that's it. <laughs> then you're just too batty for another drink. Ha ha ha. ha. That was better. That was, that was at least a little better. <laughs> I got one good one in this episode. I'm proud of that. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Going back to it, I don't see how this is right for most haunts. No. I think House of Shock's able to pull it off because they were already targeting more adult, more mature. And there are a handful of other haunts that I think do the same general thing with their marketing. Right. But, yeah, I mean, you and I, when we talk about this, I know we sound like we're trying to create the Walmart of haunting. <laughs> but it's like we want as many people as possible to come. Yeah. We want, and that means having high capacity. That means having a broad marketing that appeals to as many people as possible. Right. Because while there definitely is a market for people who want to go to more extreme and edgier haunts, yeah. at the end of the day, people who are such big haunt fans, they want to go to those edgier haunts, will go to a more middle-of-the-road one, too. Oh, yeah. And those middle-of-the-road ones will also pick up customers that maybe are really scared of haunts, and you know, right. they'll pick up a younger crowd in addition to picking up the adults. It's one of those things where, you know, you're going to... The people who want the edgier haunts, I think, are kind of at the base of the haunt industry. They're the base customers. Mm -hmm. They're going to haunt. They're going to all the haunts. Yeah. If you've got a decent haunt, they're going to show up regardless of who it's marketed at. Right. So, anyways, that's just my, my two and a half cents on that. Okay. Any other final thoughts? Uh, just remember to get in touch with us if yes. you want to tell us anything about this. Yes. Have any thoughts on it? Um, What are the... Guys in your area do. What yeah, do the haunts do in if, your area? If you run up, run, work at, or regularly attend right. a haunt that does sell alcohol, I would love to hear your thoughts and your experiences with that. Yeah, especially if you have any crazy stories <laughs> yeah, about yeah. the one night that... So-and-so got only totally hammered and... Yeah. Yeah. But you can find us at hauntweekly.com. Connect with us via Twitter at username hauntweekly. Or on Facebook as Haunt Weekly. There you can like us and follow us. And you can follow us on Twitter and all that other stuff. And like I said, we're working on revamping the site. Hopefully we'll have a new site your way soon. I know I say that every flipping week. And it hasn't happened yet. But we are working on it. It's just a difficult deal to move this podcast over. Right, especially with our day job schedules. Yeah, it's so. been a little crazy around here lately. Just A little bit. Just, just saying. But yeah, so I think that's all we have for this week. Yeah, that sounds good. On that note, everyone... I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And this was Haunt Weekly, episode number 25, talking about alcohol and haunting. Let's go get a drink. <laughs> Damn right. See you guys <laughs> next week. <laughs>